All right, hey guys, and hey, welcome to Unit 2, Lecture 4, all right? 20 unbelievable minutes of your life. All right, so today we're getting into elections. We're going to talk about congressional elections and presidential elections, all right? And in particular, let's focus on Congress, right? When I say Congress, I mean the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. When I say Congress, I mean the 435 seats in the House and the 100 seats in the Senate, okay? Um, now, a couple of things. U.S. congressional elections are scheduled. So every two years we have congressional elections, all right? Every two years the entire House of Representatives is up for re-election. And what that means is they serve two-year terms as well, all right? Every two years one-third of the United States Senate is up for re-election. They serve six-year terms, so it's staggered. Every two years one-third of the U.S. Senate is up for re-election, all right? Now, we also have... Um, single member districts in our congressional elections, right? Now, as you guys already know, the U.S. Senate, the senators in Nevada, the senators in California, et cetera, in all the 50 states represent the entire state, all right? The boundaries of their constituency or their electorate is the state of Nevada or the state of California, all right? That's the Connecticut Compromise. One house, one chamber will be based on equal representation, all right? Now, the other, the 435 seats, um, this is a map of the four congressional districts that we have in Nevada, all right? Now remember, congressional seats, or I'm sorry, house seats, are based on the, the population of a state. So Nevada has four, California has 53, all right? But again, California has two senators, just like Nevada has two senators, all right? But our senators represent the entire state. But our House members represent each of their districts, all right? And what you're going to notice is we live in Congressional District 2, all right? We'll get more into these maps when we study Congress. But what this means about a single-member district is people will run for office to, rep to be the member of Congress from the District 2. Only one person gets that seat, a single member. Same with this, same with this, same with this. Same with all 435 districts across the country for the U.S. House, all right? So and again, whenever I ask um, how many House seats are there and how many congressional districts there are, the answer is the same, 435, all right? Okay, now, um, this is contrasting, okay, single member winner take all districts with a proportional system, all right? Some Western democracies around the world use proportional systems. And I'll just tell you really quickly what there are. Imagine, say, in a country that uses a proportional system, rather than winner take all, has 100 seats available in their legislative branch. All right? And party A gets 22% of the vote. Party A, rather than an individual person, party A gets 22 seats in our 100 seat um, fictitious legislative branch. Party B gets 12%, they get 12 seats. Party C gets, you know, 30%, they get 30 seats. The seats are awarded proportionally rather than our single member winner take all districts of the 435 seats we have. All right? Okay. Now, like we said, every two years, right? So every two years, all 435 seats are up in the House, one third in the U.S. Senate. Now, before they have the general election, right, we have primary elections, right? And, and primary elections are elections in which all the Republicans will run against Republicans and all the Democrats will run against Democrats. And the idea behind a primary, which was invented by the progressives, was to allow the people to choose among their own party who was going to run in the general election. And the general election is when the D's and the R's will run against each other, right? Okay, now, the idea here was to give people a voice in choosing candidates to run in the general. Before primaries, um, the parties chose who would run in the general, all right? It didn't give a lot of democratic voice to the masses in choosing their candidates for the general election. And so the progressives invent these, all right? And add them to our election history. Now, you have a couple different types here. You have closed and open, all right? Closed primaries, all that means is if you're a registered Democrat, you can vote in the Democratic primary. And, and you can't vote in the Republican primary, and Republicans can't vote in the Democratic primary. So, registered Republicans in Nevada, because they have closed primaries, most states do, can re vote in Republican primaries. All right? And again, the way you change your party affiliation is by checking a box when you register to vote. Okay? Now, open primaries, what that means is independents can vote. All right? In a lot of states, if you have a closed primary, in people that are independent or don't register as a party 
can't vote in the primaries. All right? Okay. So, open allows independents to choose. You can either vote in the Republican primary, you can vote in the Democratic primary. All right? Now, a blanket or free love primary means independent voters can vote Democrat sometimes, Republican sometimes in the same primary election season. So maybe they want to vote in the Democratic governor's race, gubernatorial race, um, but they want to vote Republican in the congressional race, right? Okay. Um, and again, remember that we also have, although we're talking about U.S. House seats and U.S. Senate seats, at the state level, don't forget federalism, that we have the same kind of thing going on. We have state legislatures, state legislatures filled with legislators, right, that are going to be running for office and there will be primaries as well, all right, and general elections as well. All right. Now, um, look at this. This next set of notes here on 10 says factors that influence the outcome of congressional elections, right? So what impacts who wins? What are the variables to describe who wins? And you have a whole list of these. And the first thing you need to know is incumbency is the single greatest advantage, all right, for a number of reasons. And the incumbent is the person that already holds the office and is running for re-election. The challenger is the person trying to defeat the incumbent, all right. And again, I'm talking about congressional elections right now, all right. I'm not talking about the presidency at this moment, okay. So, if you look at this, 90% of U.S. House members are re-elected. 80% of U.S. Senate members are re-elected, all right. So, if you're the incumbent, you have an incredibly good chance of winning. All right, so look at some of these advantages of incumbents. Franking privilege, free mail, right? Free mail, what that means is a member of Congress, you'll, you guys, your parents may get these. It'll say, hello, you know, I'm Congressman Amade, right? And this is what I've been doing as your elected representative. I'm on this committee and that committee. I'm working hard for my constituents. That's a benefit. One, he's communicating with you, but two, he's telling you, look how good what a good job I'm doing, and therefore, remember me the next time we go for election. Whereas the challenger, if they want to get their name into your house, they got to pay for that kind of mail, right? Now, I know the internet has drastically changed this, all right, because they can access you through, you know, Twitter accounts, Facebook, you know, um, emails, you know, all that kind of stuff is a little bit different than it used to be, but still the same idea. Now, you also have campaign staff already in place, right? What that means is they have people already working for them, they have an organization, they have a system, right? They know their state, they know their congressional district, right? You know, our congressman, uh, Mark Amade from Congressional District 2 has staffers around the state that know the state, that know what their constituents want, that know what that we need, and therefore, when it goes, when you flip from representing people to running for re-election and asking their vote, you have staff already in place to twist that, turn that, and hit the ground running. Again, we're challengers, have to build a staff, pay a staff, and get that staff in place to then help them get reelected. All right. Now, also um, gerrymandered districts. All I'm going to tell you about this really quickly is these lines are drawn with a lot of fighting. All right, because we've been studying demographics, and what this means is, is you know, if you draw a line that includes people that are more likely to vote Republican than a Republican will win. If you draw lines that mean they're, they're more likely that the Democrat will win than a Democrat will win. And so, just for now, we're going to get way into gerrymandering when we study Congress. A lot of these districts are drawn in a way that benefit the existing incumbents. All right? Now, there's way more to that, but we'll study that a little bit later. All right, now, committee service to their district. Every member of Congress goes back to Congress and gets on committees. Committees are the workhorse of Congress, right? And what you do is you get on congressional committees that benefit your constituents. Nevada's going to have things with gaming, with mining, with small business, right? With a lot of land use because all our federal land, all right? You get on districts, or I'm sorry, committees that help you serve your district, all right? And you'll see again a little bit more of that as we get into Congress. All right, now, name recognition. I'm telling you, the incumbent has the advantage because one of the free mail, you see them in the news, they're on committees serving their constituents, or they're in the news again, and that name recognition helps them get reelected. All right? Now also casework for your constituents. All right? Great grandma calls you and says, Sweetie, my social security check didn't come. Right? And you being highly efficacious young citizen will call your member of Congress and say, you know, Congressperson, my great grandma's social security check didn't come. The staffers there will go, we're very concerned about that. They will call, make the calls to the executive branch to figure out why didn't that come. And then, next thing you know, great grandma's social security check comes in the mail, right? 
They've done casework for their constituents. They've helped a constituent out. Maybe one of you want to get appointed to one of the military academies. They would be helping one of their constituents, right? Maybe one of your parents is a veteran and needs help getting veterans benefits. They'll do casework for their constituent. And that gives a positive outlook for a member of Congress to their constituents. Again, things that the challengers don't have, all right? Now, pork barrel projects, all right? We're going to simplify it today because we study this in Congress. But members of Congress will work hard to bring home federal money back to their districts to build schools, to build roads, to build a variety of things, right, um, that benefit their constituents, maybe help increase the employment numbers in their, con in their districts. All right? Now, pork is generally considered excessive or wasteful spending. All right? So some people will accuse members of Congress of bringing things home to their district that maybe their district doesn't need, but they know their district wants, and it will help them get reelected. We're going to study that in a lot more detail later, all right? All right. Now, the other thing is political money, a political war chest. These members of Congress, they'll get elected, and they will raise money, raise money, raise money, getting ready for the next election. So when they get a strong challenger, they have the ability to spend a lot of money to ideally easily spend money on campaigns, on ads, and all the things you need to get reelected. All right? Okay. So those are the advantages of incumbents. Now let's move over to, again, this type of election is pretty easy, all right? Which ones are competitive, which ones are not competitive, all right? Incumbent campaigns are the least competitive because they have 80, 90% re-election rates, all right? Weak challenger campaigns, right? Again, incumbent, an incumbent facing weak challenger is not going to have a hard time getting re-elected. And you can go through these, all right? Open seats tend to be the most competitive. When we have a vacant seat, meaning no incumbent, those are the ones we're going to get the strongest candidates because they know they have the opportunity to actually win. All right. Now, again, um, the House is a little less competitive than the Senate because there's only 100 Senate seats and 435 House seats. All right. Okay. Now, midterm elections. Remember, we talked about midterm elections. Midterm elections are those elections that are between presidential years, right? So 2008 was a presidential election. 2010 was a midterm election. Only members of Congress are up for re-election. There's not, I mean, there's also state elections going on in those the years as well. But there's no presidential year, all right? Okay. Now, a key trend in this is in midterm elections, the trend since, what, 1938 to 1994, right? In every House race, we've seen the party of the president loses seats. It's a trend you're going to want to know, and we'll discuss it in class as far as why. All right, think about why. All right, now, um, here's the other thing. Uh, we have coattail effect, which we went over in class. Coattail effect means um, it can influence the outcome of an election, right? That's the big picture we're talking about again. What influences the outcome of congressional elections? We had incumbent advantages, we had the type of election, and now we're looking at coattail effect, right? And the coattail effect is simply if you have a strong candidate for, say, the presidency of one party, members of that party that are running for the Senate, that are running for the House, will benefit from a very, very popular, strong candidate, right? So you need, you know, I don't know when coattails get long, but what I know is this, is in 2000, George Bush and Al Gore, right, had an incredibly almost 50-50 as far as the, the popular vote went, right? Neither candidate's going to have strong coattails because the country split. Right? But if you get a, a campaign like a really, really strong Ronald Reagan, right, um, he will bring other Republicans on his coattails into office because those people will get out to go vote for the Re Reagan and they'll also vote for people of the same party and they'll benefit from that strong coattail effect of, uh, in the presidential race. All right? Now, the media also influences right, elections, how they cover it, what they cover, who they cover. Right? Their journalism will influence us. All right, we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, party affiliation. People still tend to vote party, remember? I know we saw some data last time where people tend to split their tickets, but quite often people stick with a party. All right? um, now, the issues, right? In some years, economics will be a big issue. In some years, war will be an issue. Right? It depends upon the year. And the candidate that speaks best to the issue can win uh, uh, the election, right? 
Um, now, you know, another thing is this, is all politics is local. You know, we have these guys back in D.C. from the House. We have these guys back in D.C. from the Senate. And they may be powerful political figures. Like, think about Harry Reid, right? Harry Reid is the Senate Majority Leader, right? He's the leader of the Senate Democrats. That's important for him, and he's a, a national leader because of that. But if he can't appeal to the issues that Nevadans care about, he can't get reelected. If he can't get reelected, he's not the Senate Majority Leader, right? Okay. Now, the other thing, um, well, technology, right? Campaigns have changed dramatically with Facebook, with Twitter, um, with all social media. They can influence, and candidates that use it appropriately or use it best are going to win elections, all right? But really, really, really focus um, on these advantages of incumbents, all right? Okay, now let's really quickly get into this last page of notes, all right? Now, I have something we're going to do in class because this is complex. So I'm literally going to make this simple in like two or three minutes for you, all right? So now I'm switching from congressional races to the presidency, all right? A whole different animal, all right? A whole different animal. Now, if we look at these notes really quickly, think about this. The big picture is, how does an individual become the president of the United States? First, they have to win their party's nomination. Does that make sense? You, you've got to be the nominee for your party, right? And uh, in the last election, we saw that Mitt Romney won the Republican nomination, and the sitting president, Barack Obama, was the Democratic nominee, all right? Um, whenever you're the sitting president, you're generally the party's nominee. Now, here's the deal. How do you become the party's nominee, all right? The way you become the party's nominee is you win delegates. Think of delegates as votes, and the candidate that gets the most delegates, or a certain number of delegates, becomes the party's nominee. Now, I have in my notes that at one point, the, the grand old party, the GOP, the Republicans, the candidate that run roughly 2,500 delegates became the party's nominee once you got that magic number. And the Democrats, at one point, it was 2,162. It'll fluctuate a little bit. Each state is awarded delegates based on population. And again, this is purely a party function. The parties have chosen how they're going to select their nominees, okay? All right. Now, the way you win delegates is two ways. You win delegates at a state's caucus or a state's um, primary. Again, different than congressional elections, all right? Nevada has a caucus. California has primaries, all right? Now, the way, what happens in a caucus is you essentially go down on caucusing day and you go talk and vote about the candidate that you like, all right? Primaries, you walk down, you just simply check, all right? Caucuses require a little more activity. We're going to get into that again in class, all right? But you either win delegates from the caucus or delegates from the primary. States determine what they have. It's up to the state, all right? Now, what we have is we eventually have, we have, we basically have a person wants to be the nominee. They go to every state's caucus or primary, and those are going to happen essentially from about January where the Iowa caucus starts all the way into the spring when the last, last caucus or primary starts. And you go to each one, right, and you try to win. You basically ask people to vote for you, right? And you get delegates based on those primaries or those caucuses, right? The first caucus of the year is Iowa. The first primary of the year is New Hampshire. And then the states kind of follow in with that, all right? Okay. Now, once we go through that whole process, and I'm simplifying it today, okay, you then, if you get X amount of delegates, depending on what your party says you need to win, you become the party's nominee. Once you're the party's nominee, you go to the national convention, which is usually um, sometime in the late, late, late spring. All right? And at the national convention, the party comes back together. They just had a big, nasty fight during the primaries and the caucuses. The parties come together, the D's with the D's, the R's with the R's, right? And they say, okay, here's our candidate for the presidency. Let's rally the troops and go beat those other guys. All right. At the nomin at the convention, they do two things. They lay out the party platform, which is all the ideas the party's going to run on, and they choose the vice presidential nominee. All right. They balance the ticket. They choose a vice presidential nominee that they believe will help the presidential candidate get more votes and win the general election. All right. So after the convention, we have the fall campaign. All right. And the fall campaign is what you guys have seen, what you guys probably saw in 2012. Right. Barack Obama running against um, Mitt Romney. 
All right, and we see that happening for until you know the second Tuesday in November. We vote. The person who gets the popular vote, now this is going to be simplified as well because we're going to talk about it in class, all right? All right? They win the presidency, essentially. Now, we're going to talk about the Electoral College and how that works in there, all right? But I'd rather do it in class because it's a whole big discussion, all right? Now, again, really quickly, to become the party's nominee, you have to win delegates, a certain number of delegates. To get delegates, you need to win primaries or caucuses, depending on what the state chooses to do. Once you get a certain amount of delegates and you become the party's nominee, you then go to the convention. You have a big meeting and at that convention they decide who the vice presidential candidate is and all the ideas, the party platform, which they're going to run on. And then you high five, have a group hug, and you go beat, try to beat the other team. Okay? Now, really, it'll be good in class to go over this, right? So study that last page, that page 12 a little bit, and then I'll give you a lot more information in class, all right? Okay. Have a great day. I'll see you next time.